talk to us about your work, please. Uh, I'll skip the, the prepared questions, but uh, give us an idea of what you do, why you do it, and why it's in the Environmental Impact Exhibit. Okay, well, I've got uh, four of my environmental paintings uh, in, uh, in the uh, exhibit. Uh, I normally, of course, I paint nature. And everybody, all artists worth their salt, whether Van Gogh or Rembrandt or whoever, paint what was in their heart. And what's in my heart and what I really care about is nature. But we're abusing nature, and so from time to time I feel uh, moved to to give a lecture, do a rant, write a letter, or paint a picture on the topic. And one I could talk about is called Driftnet. It's mm -hmm. probably the most heavy-duty uh, piece in the show, a piece that I've painted. Um, it's a, a, a white-sided Pacific dolphin and Elisa and Albert dead. Under, it was an underwater scene. They're drowned because they're caught in a drift net. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, I actually attached a real drift net across the front of the painting, mm -hmm. and so people can get an idea of what it is. And my thinking behind it is these are our bycatch. A million birds die every year by mistake as bycatch to our quick and dirty, cheap way of fishing, uh, industrial fishing. And a million mammals, um, whales and dolphins and turtles, die this way every year, too. And this is a metaphor for what's happening to the planet, so that we can have our, our lifestyle as cheap as possible. We, we have bycatch, really, in the form of destroying the planet, mm -hmm. destroying our entire environment. So that's uh, the message behind this painting. Another one is your Carmana Contrast. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that, that correctly. It, that's a two-part uh, painting. That's right. The the bottom part of the Carmana contrast is a <clears throat> is a clear cut. Again, I'm uh, I'm opposed to industrial fishing, industrial forestry, and industrial agriculture, industrial farming. Mm -hmm. Nature lend itself to industrial application. It is cheaper, as I said before, but there is no free lunch. And we can, we can pay now or we can pay later. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, the great novelist, uh, once said, we could have saved the world, but we were too cheap. Mm -hmm. So the cheapest way of logging is to clear cut. <clears throat> and that means it, it totally destroys all the microbiology and the, and the little trees and the different plants in this big swath of ecosystem that has been set back many, many, many decades. So that's what that painting is about. And at the, across the top of the painting, I have a picture of me standing beside one of these mighty giants, the biggest trees in North America. They're bigger even than the trees in Alaska. And while I was standing there, I could hear in the background, <laughs> crash. The, the logging companies were logging as fast as they could. And the special thing about this painting is a group of artists were invited in to paint Carmana Forest before it got cut down. Oh, mm -hmm. And we shamed the government and shamed the logging company into stopping. As far as I know, it's the first and one of the few, if maybe the only uh, time that a group of artists have saved a significant part of the planet. Mm -hmm. We want to come back and talk about that. I think we have Kent Ulberg on the phone now. Are you there, Kent? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Kent's a Hi, sculptor. Kent. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Kent, the sculptor, has two pieces on display as part of the Im environmental impact exhibit. Uh, he's also done monumental sculptures. I think I read the largest bronze wildlife compositions ever done spanning several city blocks. Glad to have you here, Kent. Well, thank you. You have uh, two pieces, Requiem and Interdependency, on the exhibit. And I was interested, Requiem, you said, is a, a maquette or a model for the Exxon Valdez oil spill monument. Can you tell us a little bit that, about that one and uh, the monument itself? Well, uh, you know, first of all, there, there are different approaches, you know, that artists have. There's the activist approach and then the approach of celebrating nature. And I'm like Bob Bateman. We are old friends. And I'm very passionate about nature and its beauty. And probably starting from my childhood, 
in a little Swedish fishing village on an island in the North Sea. So I'm very close to the sea and to nature, and most of the time I like to communicate this passion about the beauty I see. Now, the requiem is, is not so very common. It's the activist approach, and it really communicates my shock and my sadness of the violation of one of the most beautiful ecosystems. And I did this sculpture just as a personal reaction when I heard about this. I was all alone in my studio, and then Mozart's Requiem came on the public radio, KEDT in Corpus Christi, Texas, and it's always playing in my studio, and it just flowed. And when, and when the music was done, so was the sculpture, and, and it got the title. But then a major art patron and an environmentalist saw the sculpture and wanted to have it as a monumental sculpture to be placed. Uh, by Prince William Sound. And so he, he approached the, the, the public officials in the area and everything else and showed the sculpture, and they refused. They did not want it. Hmm. And oh. then he proposed to buy a piece of land and privately owned and put it on there. And nobody would, would sell it to him. They basically ran him out of town. So that sculpture never did get oh, okay. a monument. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, it, it's still a very passionate reaction. It is an eagle that is dying, suffering, the head cast back. And, you know, also a, a symbol of freedom and of us in America and everything else and the threat to all of us. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is that we can do damage. It's something as simple and stupid as a drunk, irresponsible sea captain running up on the best-known reef in the air and spilling millions of gallons of oil. And it hit me very deeply because I'm a seafaring man. I have a sort of a captain's license as well. Mm-hmm. And, and for something like that to happen was, was so crazy. And, of course, it's very appropriate, too, since I live on the, by the Gulf of Mexico and the recent BP oil spill, which yes. was even greater. So that is my reaction to that. And my other sculpture, at Interdependency, that indeed is also a maquette. And that sculpture is a 14-foot monument. And it's at University of Texas Marine Science Center. And uh, in that sculpture, I have another approach. Um, I wanted to communicate the complexity and the fragility and the interdependency in a marine ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And in that sculpture, I have 48 different species of animals, from microscopic plankton to to mammals, that came together and they create the sculpture of a tartan, which is actually the symbol of the city of Port Aransas, where the University of Texas Marine Science Center is. But that species, tartan, is very dependent on, on, and sensitive to the health, health of several ecosystems. And, and in some areas, environmental toxins have severely de- depleted the population. In fact, Port Aransas, Texas, used to be called Tarpon, Texas. And even Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, went there to sport fish with tarpon, and we have hardly any tarpon anymore. So uh, that sculpture, it, talking about the complexity and also to teach the marine students about the complexity of the of ecosystem in nature, where we play a critical part. We really have uh, two related questions for you, uh, for you both, Bob Baton and Kent Alberg. Uh, one is how being oh, oh, sending a deliberate message affects your process as, as writers. There is that school that always says art should be done for art's sake. It doesn't doesn't send a message, doesn't necessarily communicate. But the other one, uh, since you do overtly wish to send a message, who are the people who receive that message and what kind of impact would you like to have on your, your viewers? And it probably differs for both of you, Kent, because you do these monumental sculptures outdoors, Robert, because you do paintings that presumably hang indoors somewhere. 
So that's a broad question. I'd like to hear from you both about your art technique and whom you would like to reach with your art. Is it my turn? Yes. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think you'll find Kent and I have very similar uh, answers to that question. I think uh, generally, as Kent just said, we celebrate what we love in nature and depict that. Um, and, but that is being threatened, and we can't help speaking through the way we speak, which is through our art. Um, others do it through writing and, and photography and documentary films, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I'm uh, I, uh, I'm just uh, I, I think any artist really should do it for themselves. I don't think there's any wrong anything wrong with having a message. All art through mm -hmm. the ages, you know. Renaissance and all the way through the entire history of art. There's you know, look at the castles Guernica or look at the great art of the churches and so on. There has always, always mm -hmm. been a mm -hmm. message sometimes mm -hmm. uh, along with the beauty. And so, uh, uh, but but I think bo both both will certainly speaking for myself. I do this to express myself, and um, I hope it makes all, all I can hope is it makes people pause and think. And perhaps when they have a choice with their shopping for seafood or whatever it might be or for forest products um, or when they're voting for a politician, uh, I often, when little kids ask me, what can I do to help uh, nature, I don't say go and pick up litter. I say, um, browbeat your parents into <laughs> voting for politicians who care and pay attention to nature. That's where the buck stops, it seems, in politics, right? Right. right? Political season right now, of course. Right. And Kent? Yes, exactly like Bob said. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to speak from your heart. You know, uh, certainly my art is not about propaganda. Uh, I just live my passion. You know, my creativity is based on what I love. And, and you know, my feelings. And like I said about the, the, the Requiem sculpture, it just flowed through me and flowed out. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how it communicates. Uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, wealthy people hate the piece. And, mm -hmm. and my artist friends normally like it. And um, I had a show in Sweden, and it was bought by the Swedish Environmental <laughs> nice. uh, Agency. Nice. But um, most of the time, actually, I'm probably less... Um, uh, you know, involved in, in the environmental sort of uh, propaganda than Bob is. Bob does a lot more lecturing and stuff than I do. But, uh, you know, when you have a sculpture, you know, for example, like my, my sculpture for the students um, in the in, uh, University of Texas, you know, they have, for example, competitions to try to find the 50 species. And some of them are very well hidden. If you don't mm -hmm. have a cheat list, you can't find them. So mm -hmm. I'm sort of hoping, while they are really competing to try to find them, they are also at the same time realizing the complexity. And maybe they mm -hmm. can learn of the interdependency in all of nature. You know. So, and of course, my, my biggest sculpture of all that we talked about, it takes up five, five city blocks in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, seven. Mm -hmm. And wow. it's called Spirit of Wilderness. And now there's a big city. But I wanted to tell them that one time a herd of bison roamed here. Mm -hmm. So I have a herd of bison, a little bigger than life, running through town. And they don't respect architecture and stuff. They mm -hmm. go where they please because the spirits are here. And they're running through corners of buildings. And then they, they scare a, a flock of geese that take off from a fountain, and it's 58 geese with eight-foot wingspan, oh my and they fly God. around the city attached to traffic lights. So you can't really ignore them, and flying through parking garages and, and so on. <laughs> and, and what I'm trying to say is, look, guys, what was here? Yeah. And, and, you know, we've displaced them. But the spirits are with us, of nature is with us, and it's worth taking care of. And, and people do interact with them. I mean... One of the most warming things happened to me the other day. A lady I don't even know from her iPhone sent me a picture of her child, little child, hug, hugging the bison, you know, uh -huh. baby bison. And I think that interaction will raise our consciousness about nature. 
but that was not really my intent. My intent was to celebrate. But if you have work in your hometown that you see every day when you go to work, it's hard to ignore it. And it must play in your consciousness about nature. That's what I hope. I, I have so many more questions, and we have no time. Um, we thank you both, Bob Bateman and Ken Olberg, for being with us tonight. Um, and I want to go to Omaha. Their exhibit is um, Environmental Impact. It's at St. Mary's College. And if you can't get to the exhibit, you can read about it on David's website, which is davidjwagnerllc.com slash environmental impact. And you can read about it, um, and there's an underline between environmental and impact. And you can also read about it through the blog of the Millennium Sci- uh, Alliance of Science. Sorry, I'll say that again. Millennium Alliance of Science and the Biosphere. That's MAHB at um, M-A-H-B dot Stanford dot E-D-U. And we'll post those sites, including David's, Kent's, and uh, David Wagner, who organized the exhibit, and Bob's on our website, along with our recordings of this show. And we also want to thank Joan Diamond and Erica Gravinus of Mob for helping us arrange this interview. And we so much appreciate having you. Thank you so much. And I hope people will take the time to learn more about your work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Great honor. Good night. <laughs>